The floor oh, is yours. Thank you. Thanks for this kind of introduction. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's my great pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's my great pleasure to share with you some of our work. So this will be about um, the use of computational imaging for creating new types of um, microscopy systems, new types of sensors and diagnostic tools with an emphasis on mobile health, on telemedicine, as well as some, some of the global health challenges that we have uh, in, in regards to global health. Uh, and one of the core um, platforms that we today um, use to bring some of these uh, computational imaging tools, sensing tools to, uh, to, to reality is actually the mobile phone itself. And I'll share with you a brief introduction about how mobile phones are progressing in terms of the, the entire uh, device itself, but also the components, the subcomponents, how it's come a, a long way enabling new science and engineering through uh, some of these uh, interfaces. And I'd like to start by showing you this uh, comparison between the uh, Moore's law, um, showing you how the uh, transistor count in billions has been doubling every two years as predicted by Gordon Moore. What is shown here on the same logarithmic uh, graph is the megapixel count of our mobile phones. What you can see here is that indeed, surprisingly, the megapixel count of our mobile phones over the last decade or so has been doubling every two years. This is not expected, but this is essentially a, a reality in front of us. And engineers, scientists now are looking at this as a great opportunity to uh, create new types of interfaces or use some of these components to uh, bring advanced optical imaging and sensing in a cost-effective and lightweight uh, manner to essentially our pockets and, and, and do some of the measurements that we normally do in advanced labs. Um, some of these recent generation of smartphones, uh, they enable us actually to even see individual viruses, individual DNA molecules using attachments to a, a mobile phone. So that's come a long way. I'll share some of those with you in, in, in today's presentation. In addition to this, the smartphone is, itself is also extremely exciting because it works like a supercomputer. So you can actually access, have access to some of uh, uh, these optical uh, imaging and sensing data through the phone, but at the same time use the phone to process it. You can bring computer vision, machine learning, running on graphical processing units embedded in our mobile phones. That's creating some unique opportunities for utilizing the phone as a biomedical measurement tool. This is all coming together because of economies of scale. We have more than 7 billion cell phone subscribers. That's the main reason why our, why our phones do not cost as much as our cars do. Uh, but this is also creating, as I said, a very unique uh, platform. And what's very striking here is that around 80% of these phones are being used in developing parts of the world. So it's a huge infrastructure that already exists in front of us. So why not tap into it to bring some more advanced uh, technologies to uh, the field uh, and resource poor settings? This is a theme in my lab. We create, using computational optical techniques, new microscopes, new sensors, new diagnostic tools that are integrated with mobile phones or mobile phone components. This will be something that I'll be uh, uh, describing in more detail today. And on this slide, I'm sharing with you some of these devices, some of these interfaces that we've created. As shown here, it's now a routine to convert the phone into an advanced microscope to the level where you can do fluorescence, bright field, multimodal imaging uh, using the phone itself uh, to look at cells, to look at even viruses and even single DNA molecules that are fluorescently labeled. So creating some very, very interesting, unique opportunities to conduct science, measurements, advanced measurements, even, as I said, in extreme resource-poor settings. In addition to this, you can actually utilize the components of the phone, especially the imager, the silicon chip, the CMOS imager, the 5 megapixel, 10 megapixel imager that you have at the back of your phone. That could also enable us to create some non-standard, non-unique forms of microscopes, as, as I point here. These are computational lensless microscopes that, for example, this one would generate about a billion useful pixels. Uh, a gigapixel 
a microscopic image would be feasible with these kinds of designs, which I'll in detail uh, describe in the next few slides. Also enabled by, uh, by mobile phones and the camera interfaces that we have. In addition to microscopy, you can also utilize the phone and, and smart applications written specifically for this task as a uh, biomarker uh, sensor. This is actually an albumin detector. It's a fluorescence-based uh, assay with an optical readout at the back to quantify albumin concentration in urine, uh, a few parts per uh, million level of sensitivity. Next, I'm sh sharing with you some of our recent work on other applications of uh, this, this idea of, of using the mobile phone for advanced measurements. This one is actually using nanoparticles, uh, plasmonic nanoparticles, to quantify heavy metals in, in water uh, using the color change induced by uh, mercury ions. Uh, and it can achieve, uh, with a very inexpensive attachment and per test, maybe a few cents, less than four cents per test, you can actually uh, quantify mercury concentration with three to four parts per uh, billion nanograms per mil level of sensitivity. Um, some other examples are shown here, looking for waterborne uh, pathogens sensitively and specifically using the microscopic imaging interface as well as the front end of sample preparation uh, makes some of these uh, devices very exciting in terms of screening of uh, pathogens in drinking water, uh, uh, even in, in the field. If I have time, I'll go over some of these uh, results uh, toward the end of my presentation. Um, this one is another recent work which we've created actually a well plate reader. Uh, it's, a, it's an automated uh, readout for 96 well plates, frequently used for high throughput screening um, applications. This is a colorimetric. We can also have a fluorometric uh, measurement in a, a very lightweight and e easy to use interface that essentially reads the entire 96 well plate without any scanning optics using a fiber optic array. Um, in addition to this, in addition to the mobile phone itself providing us very useful um, set of tools to bring advanced measurements to, to the, to the uh, uh, field setting, we've been also uh, working with other types of interfaces, variable computers, uh, as well as, for example, the glass. This is Google Glass being used to read some um, diagnostic tests uh, using um, the camera interface. Compared to a smartphone, um, the camera interface of, of Glass, Google Glass, is not as advanced. Uh, however, it's charming in certain uh, applications, especially the hands-free and voice-activated interface of, of Google Glass makes it quite exciting so that you can actually interface and quantify some tests without uh, touching uh, the specimen or without using your hands to uh, work with, with your phone. And that's where I think for emergency medicine and in similar situations, I think this kind of an interface is also quite exciting. Um, we're also very much interested in variable systems, especially sensors that are uh, embedded inside the skin, underneath the skin, to uh, access interstitial fluid and blood maybe one millimeter, two millimeters away from the skin surface. So if you're interested in variable systems, uh, implantable sensors, injectable sensors, um, we've recently published a, uh, a manuscript on a variable microscope to quantify sensors, fluorescent sensors, through the skin. Uh, it's something that, if you're interested, uh, I won't talk today as much about this direction, but uh, if you're working on uh, implantable uh, sensors through, through skin, you may want to look at our recent uh, work on this. So these are um, platforms that benefit from computation to bring advanced measurement tools as sensitive, as specific, as high resolution as you expect them in lab conditions to be actually cost-effective, compact, lightweight, and integrated with actually consumer devices so that some of those measurements can be done at the home for uh, managing chronic patients or in field settings for diffusing in the function of an advanced hospital to several tens of kilometers away, especially for low resource settings. So it will serve many functions. Um, but there's one element that I'd like to also emphasize, which also relates very well with the first uh, speaker, Lee's talk, and that is the connectivity of these devices and the data that these kinds of devices, mobile devices, generate is first of all connected, and second, it's labeled as a function of space and time. And this connectivity and the labeling uh, is, a, is a great opportunity for us to look at big data and small data at the same time. So that you can actually have population level 
understanding of, for example, how certain diseases, how certain biomarkers, how certain pathogens are changing as a function of space and time, and how it's also changing, uh, for, for, for example, the, the same household. So that aspect, I think, is also very exciting for uh, uh, medical diagnostics and epidemiological studies. So the, this connectivity and the labeling of, of the data is another very exciting aspect of these kinds of mobile devices that are competitive in terms of what they do, at the same time connected. So after this brief intro, I'd like to uh, start talking to you more about the details of some of these devices. Because of the limited time, I'll select some of these and uh, expand more on what kinds of data they generate, what kinds of samples that they can um, image, and how uh, they, they work in more detail. And I'll start with microscopy, because it's universally applicable to various different things. At the micro scale, nano scale, for diagnostics, for environmental monitoring, for whatever you want to do, for material science, you need uh, microscopes. And now I'll share with you uh, some of the unique aspects of these types of computational microscopes. This work that I'll describe in the next few slides is not about just miniaturization. It's not about cost effectiveness. It's not about making them simple, um, uh, field portable, or compact. It's also a different way of doing microscopy. So those benefits of compactness, lightweight, cost effectiveness, are byproducts of a different way of doing microscopy. And that's actually what I'm going to be describing now. So whether it's running on a mobile phone, as shown here, or using the uh, CMOS imager taken off the phone with these interfaces, these types of microscopes are actually quite different than standard microscopes in the sense that there is no optics, there is no imaging unit between the sample and the imaging sensor. This imaging sensor is, let's say, a 5 megapixel, 10 megapixel imager taken off a mobile phone or a webcam or any digital camera. It's actually the silicon chip that has photodetectors on it. That's the main component of these microscopes that are lensless, meaning that the sample is directly placed on top of this imager chip, whether it's a CCD or a CMOS-based imager. The sample to sensor distance is typically sub-millimeter, meaning that whatever we want to image in transmission is placed on it. That's why we call these types of lensless microscopes on-chip microscopes, meaning that the sample is placed on a chip. So this is a chip-scale microscope. The main component is actually a silicon photodetector array. And um, you illuminate the sample with a very simple light source, an LED, light-emitting diode. So in this embodiment here, there's an LED behind this 3D printed enclosure. The sample goes from the site. This is a USB-controlled and powered uh, CMOS imager a five megapixel, let's say, and the sample goes right in front of it, almost touching with sub-millimeter gap. The same kind of a configuration on the phone. The sample goes from the side to interface with the CMOS imager of the phone, and there's an LED here. Or you can use CCDs uh, like this one, which has a very large active area to conduct microscopy. This is the, the, the underlying physics behind this kind of a microscope, there's no image formation unit, is actually based on uh, holography. It's, it's recording um, shadows of the specimen. So by placing, for example, uh, a blood sample in front of a CMOS imager with sub-millimeter gap, you'll be capturing diffracted pattern, diffraction patterns of these cells. These are red blood cells and, and these are the shadows that are formed by diffraction of light through the cell. It's kind of like as I bring my hand close to the table, I start to see a shadow of it. It's the same thing that's happening at the micro scale. The light is scattered through the cell or the tissue sample of interest. It's interfering with the background light to give you a holographic shadow. This is not traditional holography in the sense that it's not using coherent sources. We could literally use sunlight as well. In fact, we've done that. But for reliable purposes, we're using LED light. So this is incoherent holography spatially and temporally, it's broadband. All of this is enabled by the on-chip imaging geometry, by placing the sample very close to the sensor. Of course, this is our starting bit. Then we do holographic reconstruction to get these intensity oscillations that you see at the detector coming from the shadows to create 
the morphology of the cells as if you're looking through a regular microscope. This transformation is enabled by coherent imaging and phase retrieval. So essentially, we try to retrieve the complex wave uh, of the uh, uh, scattered light and do time reversal on this to give you back computationally exactly the, the cells of interest. These are red blood cells, giving you the morphology and, and the, the same spatial features that you normally find in a traditional light microscope. The math behind this has different degrees of complexity. As I'll go over through my presentation, my slides, I'll give you some different levels of uh, complexity. But at the very basic level, you can think of this as phase retrieval. You have an amplitude that's recorded at the uh, CMOS imager, at the CCD imager, through on-chip imaging. And we're trying to find the phase that is lost. Once you have the phase information, which you can iteratively recover by going back and forth between object and uh, hologram planes, you can converge to the phase information, as shown here. This phase, together with the recorded amplitude, gives a complex field. You can time reverse to go back to the object. All of this routine is computationally done, replacing an objective lens or other types of imaging systems that you normally have in traditional lens-based microscopes in your labs. Between the specimen and the sa sample, between the sample and the uh, sensor, there's an imaging optics. We replace all of that with, with uh, this kind of a phase retrieval routine, which is very cost effective, obviously. You, have, you can run these uh, in simple laptops. And since these are mostly based on fast Fourier transforms, it's very fast. You can do some of the, this computation in, in a few milliseconds. So this is just the beginning um, in the sense that in a very simple manner, using phase retrieval, you can convert the basic functions of a traditional uh, microscope into a pocket microscope as shown here, which is extremely inexpensive and lightweight. This one is less than 50 grams. As I said, the sample goes from the side. All the components here are standard off-the-shelf components. LEDs are very inexpensive, low-power devices. They're USB-powered, and CMOS images are the same as we have in our cell phones. And it gives you uh, very interesting features. In addition to being compact and cost-effective, there are some other features of interest that make these types of microscopes very appealing for high-throughput imaging. One of the most important features that I'd like to emphasize which um, uh, I'll continue uh, on this emphasis uh, for a while, is the field of view. These microscopes are larger, have larger fields of view than traditional light microscopes. In this pocket microscope that you see there, it's about 20, 25 millimeters square field of view. This is very large compared to a traditional light microscope, like a 10x objective lens, would have a, maybe a millimeter square, typically. This is coming from chip scale imaging. Whatever the active area of the sensor is, in this case, it's our field of view. Most of your cell phones, if you open them up, you will see a silicon chip. That would be about half a centimeter by half a centimeter. So there you go, 25 millimeters square is your field of view. By placing the sample, we gain a huge amount of field of view advantage compared to lens-based microscopes. There's one trade-off here, we've lost some resolution. This is a modest resolution microscope to start with. So its effective numerical aperture, its effective resolution is about one to two micrometers in this sim simple embodiment. That's limited by the pixel size. If I bring the sample very close to the sensor, I've gained the field of view, but I've lost the resolution because of pixelation. The pixel size drives now my resolution. So it's field portable, cost effective, lightweight, equivalent to maybe a 10x objective lens, but more than an order of magnitude wider field of view. So how can we take this same uh, platform, the same ideas, and push the resolution to submicron, beat the pixelation limit, while retaining all of these advantages? I want to still be very high throughput, wide field of view, cost effective, field portable, but now beat the resolution so that it becomes close to a 100x objective lens that you, you like to use in some applications. For this, we complicate the design a little bit, but still, it's, it's lightweight and cost effective. From a design like this, we go to another design which, which is taller, but still uh, maybe uh, as tall as your iPhone. If you open up one of these devices, the new design, you can see that it's actually still based on the same on-chip imaging system. So this is where you, go, you have your CMOS, half a centimeter by half a centimeter typical active area. Sample goes in front of it, sub-millimeter gap, 
your field of view is dictated by the active area. Now, the illumination is a bit more complicated, and that's where this illumination engine helps us to push the resolution beyond um, the pixelation limit to the diffraction limit. So if you look at a, at a single time, only one of the LEDs is on, but now there is an array of LEDs and they're digitally turned on and off. Nothing is mechanically moving here, so it's all programmed, LEDs are switching on and off. And every time new LED is on, you're having the holograms shift at the sub-pixel level. So you record the same information of the static sample with different perspectives, enabling the holographic pattern, or the shadow, so to speak, to shift at the sub-pixel level. Then we take that sequence of images that are each sub-pixel shifted, maybe 10 of them, maybe 20 of them, and synthesize a super-resolved image. This is the same super-resolution, pixel super-resolution framework that is used actually in security cameras. If you're far away from security camera, your face is not resolved well because of the lower resolution system. So by capturing, actually, as the object is moving or as the cameraman's hand is shaking, you can have some, some frames, maybe 10 frames, 20 frames, where each one is slightly sub-pixel shifted. Then you can actually synthesize a higher resolution image through pixel super resolution. One way of looking at it is actually dividing each pixel digitally into smaller pixels. This is exactly how we do it so that a single hologram has these beautiful shadows that contain spatial features, but some of them are undersampled due to the large pixel size. After pixel super resolution, by merging these sub-pixel shifted uh, holograms and coming up with a global uh, hologram that has much smaller pixel size compared to the native pixel size, we can actually uh, start to see some of these higher fringes, higher oscillations, to be sampled back. And these contain actually higher spatial frequencies and higher resolution. If you were to reconstruct one of these pixel super resolved holograms, you can start to see the features that are normally washed away. This is a single hologram because of limited resolution coming from the pixel size. It's equivalent to a 10x objective lens. But now you have, after pixel super resolution, very quickly you can reconstruct amplitude and phase images of finer features. So this means with this kind of a, a system, you take a 10 megapixel imager, let's say, and digitally create a billion pixels out of it by dividing each pixel into 100 smaller pixels, 10 by 10. This gives you a phenomenally small effective pixel size that is sampling diffraction limit resolution and giving you a very large field of view with a lot of effective pixels uh, on the order of a billion. So, in an earlier uh, design, you can now do a screening of, uh, of uh, malaria. This is actually a thin smear that is a monolayer of cells where you can look at the phase reconstructions after pixel super resolution to see these uh, red blood cells that are infected with malaria parasites. This is the comparison. And you can do this across a very large field of view. This is actually a, a similar blood smear. Um, this is a, a large field of view. You see a lot of these white blood cells and red blood cells. And you zoom in, you can see the um, signatures of the parasites. Microscopy for uh, looking at malaria um, uh, positive patients is still one of the gold standards for diagnosis as well as for looking at the treatment of patients to understand the peristemia. So now you can bring an advanced digital microscope to, um, um, to even resource proof settings with this kind of a lightweight and compact and cost effective design, which gives you um, quite detailed and high resolution across a large field of view. Using a state of the art imager, you can actually create very competitive systems that are almost diffraction limited. So this is actually one of those CMOS imagers that some of your cell phones have. This is, uh, as, as you can see, it's very small. Um, this is what gives you the 10 megapixel performance. And this green region is the active region. If you zoom in, you can do a, a microscopy across it with about a resolution that is on the order of 220, 20, 250 nanometer uh, in the visible part of the spectrum. So this is kind of um, um, achieving a, a numerical aperture that's almost limited by the refractive index of the medium. And you can actually push more resolution if, if you desire to by using other degrees of freedom. So far, I've been talking about vertical illumination, the light source being vertical, 
with some, with some sub-pixel shifts. Um, so uh, the light source was uh, shifting to create sub-pixel shifts at the hologram domain. By the way, this doesn't have to be controlled. So one, one thing uh, uh, that is beautiful about this platform is the hardware can be very uh, simple, and it doesn't have to be a repeatable system because we do not read any one of these sub-pixel shifts from the mechanical system. This is computationally calculated. And the, the light source shift here can be a few hundred microns, and we don't need to know what it is. We will understand it after image exposure by cross-correlating those images. So that's why repeatability is not an issue here. And um, if you add to the same framework multiple angles of illumination, you actually synthesize a bigger passband for your spatial frequencies. You take some of the evanescent waves and bring them to the propagation re regime and vice versa. So that it, it helps you, uh, in principle, this kind of an approach helps you to um, go twice the refractive index of, of light, uh, of light in, in, in the medium that you have. And you can actually use all of these different angles to acquire information from other spatial frequencies. For example, the green here represents the vertical illumination. It has a certain spatial frequency passband. This, is, this blue map here is the spatial frequency map. By going to oblique angles, you start to explore higher and higher fre uh, frequencies. And if you do this across two orthogonal axes, you can combine uh, in this light range here, light blue range, and uh, have a bigger spatial frequency um, uh, aperture uh, in front of you. So this is uh, illustrated here with higher resolution with a vertical illumination. This is uh, the, the pass band that you have, but uh, with uh, using two axes with this kind of a, a discrete uh, sampling of angles, you can actually start to resolve even smaller um, objects. And this is an effective NA of 1.4 in air. So um, this, this is one way to push uh, resolution for two-dimensional objects. The same framework can be used for tomography. If your object is three-dimensional, you can actually use multiple angles of illumination to do multi-perspective uh, tomographic reconstruction. Um, but for two-dimensional objects, you can do better resolution, especially useful for thin smears or uh, pathology slides. Um, in the next slide, I'm showing you a movie that is utilizing multiple angles uh, to do tomographic uh, reconstruction, in this case, of a C. elegans sample. So this is actually a lensless reconstruction of um, uh, the volumetric um, uh, uh, cross-section of uh, the C. elegans as, as you scan the depth in, in microns here. This is showing you have different degrees of freedom, can give you higher resolution in 2D or sometimes uh, axial resolution improvement in the form of uh, uh, a tomographic reconstruction. In a recent design, this is uh, how uh, some of our recent um, super-resolution lensless microscopes look like. So it has the same super-resolution engine. These are individual uh, LEDs that are coupled to fiber optic cables. This array here gives us the super-resolution to beat the pixelation. We also have here colorful LEDs to bring color information that's especially useful for diff using different stains in your pathology samples. And there's another degree of freedom here that, that I'd like to draw your attention to, and that is this Z stage here, which helps us to modulate the sample to sensor distance. This submillimeter gap can also be modulated here to bring extra information. Once again, this doesn't have to be repeatable. In fact, we do not read anything of this Z stage. After image exposure, through autofocusing, we understand the delta Z, how much modulation we put in there, which means the device itself can be 3D printed and it doesn't have to be very precise. We do not read anything off the device itself, whether it's humid or hot, temperature variations, we don't care about those because images will reflect them and we'll understand that. This Z modulation is very powerful because it helps us to do phase retrieval in a very robust way, without any assumptions. So what this enables us is, now you have M different holograms, M different amplitude measurements, coming from M different heights between the sample and sensor, all sub-millimeter, very small gaps, a few tens of microns. What this framework helps us to do is, I can take now any one of these measurements at a given height, let's say this one, Assume a certain random phase to it that was lost in the intensity only detection, and I can hop to different heights following the red or blue arrows, go back and forth, so that at every 
uh, arrow, at the end of every arrow, I can insert my measurement and retain phase. This is called error reduction. You're refining your guess at every uh, 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 step. And this is at the end converging with just one loop between the, the uh, red and uh, blue arrows. You will be converging to m different measurements that are all self-consistent, which means you can have any one of them or you can average them to increase your signal to noise ratio. Typically, three, four would be sufficient for us. So by doing multi-height across three different uh, uh, sample to sensor distances, we can do very robust phase retrieval. This enables us to look at more dense, complicated uh, uh, objects like connected tissue samples. This is a breast um, tissue. It's about 10 microns in thickness. Uh, and it's showing you actually the standard field of view that you would get with a 40x objective. So this, this is the field of view that you would get a, with a 40x objective. You would have to scan this. This kind of a field of view is the, the field of view that comes through the sensor's active area. It's about 20 millimeters square. And if you zoom in, you would be seeing the lens-free reconstructions are very well matched to uh, a standard uh, 40x objective lens. And these are how the row of holograms look. They look to our bare eye as noise. In fact, they contain uh, all the useful information at the subcellular level that you can see here. We can also bring color to this process by using multiple colors of illumination. At the same time, even, you can have three light sources, red, green, and blue, illuminate at the same time, and we can use the color filters to separate them out and uh, bring the uh, synthetic color um, uh, that will label the samples. In fact, we did some blind studies by giving a board-certified pathologist our lens-free reconstructions versus a traditional light microscope for diagnosis, diagnosing breast cancer. We've achieved 99% accuracy compared to uh, uh, the gold standard pathology microscope using our technique. And that 1% was not our fault. It was actually the random error uh, that the diagnostician had. So these are very uh, competitive microscopes in the way that they work, in the, in the resolution and contrast that they create, and retaining the features of interest for diagnostics purposes. This is another great example of how these kinds of microscopes could be used for screening purposes. This is a cervical, uh, uh, this is a pep smear, Papa Nicolau smear. It's used for screening of cervical cancer. Um, in the United States, because of in interesting insurance laws, a diagnostician is liable for all these cells that are put in here. Uh, and they have to literally look at them one by one, at least for certain uh, cases. And uh, this is again showing you the comparison with, between the field of view of a traditional lensless microscope versus um, a standard uh, 40x objective lens. And these are some of our colorful reconstructions versus standard microscopes shown uh, underneath. Um, everything that has an arrow here is actually an abnormal set, which has a larger nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. One important advantage so far that I haven't been emphasizing is uh, the depth of field that we have. We have the field of view, as I've emphasized, very large compared to traditional light micros microscope. Cost effectiveness and mobility are also uh, big advantages. But the other third important advantage is we have a depth of field that is a few hundred microns to maybe even a few millimeters, depending on what you want to do. That's why for a pep smear or any other sample that is not flat, we don't have to do autofocusing. During the image exposure, we don't care. At the post-processing level, we can digitally uh, autofocus and give a remote pathologist the depth of field knob, that the physical knob that the microscope uh, typically has. Which means this is great for telepathology because from the server on demand, you can actually have these raw images reconstructed almost in real time, uh, giving you the information at different depths. So that you don't have to scan in XY and depth, which is traditionally done in high throughput pathology. So this saves also a, a very important complexity, cost, that is associated with depth of field scanning. So far I've been focusing on CMOS imagers, and everything that I've shown you is literally coming from mobile phones. These are the CMOS images that we use in our mobile phones. And that's the signature of this kind of a field of view. Typically, half a centimeter by half a centimeter is what CMOS technology through our mobile phones or webcams provide us. But that's not the limit. This is a black box, this is a framework that doesn't care about the sensor. It can be a CMOS off a mobile phone, but it can also be a, 
CCD imager taken from a telescope or a high-end camera. If you were to use CCDs, you get a great advantage in terms of field of view. This has got about 20 millimeters square, but this field of view here, using a CCD, charge coupled device, you can actually have about 18 centimeters square field of view. It's as large as your palm. Now you can do high throughput imaging across three orders of magnitude, more than a thousand fold larger fields of view with a similar resolution to maybe a 10x objective lens. This is the field of view of a 10x now. And, and this is uh, the field of view that you can get with, with uh, a simple CCD. This means there is some very interesting, unique um, uh, imaging system here that decouples resolution from field of view. In traditional microscopy, resolution and, and field of view are coupled to each other. If you want to improve resolution, you sacrifice field of view and vice versa. These are tightly coupled to the space bandwidth product of your imaging system, and there's always a trade-off between them. This kind of a microscope doesn't have this coupling. If I have the same pixel architecture and more megapixels, I improve my field of view without affecting my resolution. If next generation CMOS imagers have even smaller, field, smaller pixel size and larger megapixels, I can improve both resolution and field of view at the same time. That's a very unique and, 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 a, and a very powerful system. That's why I've shown you at the very beginning that chart that compared megapixel count of our mobile phones with the Moore's law, exponential increase. That's very exciting for us because we're riding on that curve to improve our imaging system with just the help of the economies of scale helping us with better sensors, more megapixels, and smaller pixel size so that we can improve the performance and field of view at the same time uh, uh, with this black box. So this is a very interesting and unique opportunity for us. So far I've been talking about resolution, how this kind of a system using different degrees of freedom, using multi-illumination, multi-angle illumination, using source shifting, using sample to sensor modulation, distance mod modulation, how we can have these different degrees of freedom push the resolution to the diffraction limit, to refractive index of, of, of medium, or maybe twice it. That's one way of uh, uh, looking at a microscope, but the other way is actually signal-to-noise ratio. So you, you have a microscope that can be diffraction limited, but it doesn't mean you can always see sub-wavelength particles. Uh, for example, a virus, because those isolated particles, detection of them is not a resolution problem. It is a signal-to-noise ratio and contrast to noise ratio problem. So the next challenge for this kind of a microscope is to push its sensitivity so that it can see individual nanoparticles, individual viruses. So it can also have another domain that traditional light microscopes are very powerful at. So now I'll switch gears and start talking about sensitivity to sub-wavelength or objects uh, and still retain our uh, performance uh, against a traditional light microscope. In this case, we are having a, a ch big challenge here, and that is trying to see a nanoparticle or a sub-wavelength particle through a transmission imaging system is very difficult. It's like trying to see the moon in a sunny day in Los Angeles. You cannot see that because this reflected light from the moon it's going to be very, very weak compared to the direct sunlight that is flooding your retina. That's the same problem here because nanoparticles are terrible uh, antennas. They, don't, they have a very small cross-section because they're sub-wavelength. They scatter very weakly. As a result, my photo detector array here, the CMOS or CCD, no matter what you use, is going to be mostly detecting the direct uh, uh, transmitted light. Nothing useful. I want to see the particles. I want to see the nanoparticles and, and viruses. To solve this problem of detecting or seeing the moon in a sunny day, we started to use self-assembly techniques, very inexpensive, simple techniques, to actually build refractive elements around individual nanoparticles so that we can see their presence and size them, quantify them. The physics behind this is very similar to actually taking two rings as shown here, and dipping them into a soap solution. As you take them apart, you form, through self-assembly, a beautiful shape, a catenoid, between those two rings. This is a self-assembled structure, a very thin membrane. 
In fact, this is the same thing that is happening at the nanoscale. If you place a particle in the middle here and shrink the dimensions to nanoscale, this is exactly what's happening. Every single particle, let's say this blue particle here, is through self-assembly forming around a polymer, room temperature polymer, that is exactly taking this catenoid shape. It's a minimal surface, it exhibits zero net curvature, and it forms this nano lens through wherever these particles are captured on a surface. This refractive element here that is self-assembled is helping us with our poor signal-to-noise ratio. It's essentially the same as coating the moon with a polymer that reflects better so that I can see the moon as a shiny object during the day. It's the same thing that's happening here. If you zoom into the same large field of view, you'd be seeing very weak holograms. Only after you reconstruct them, you'd be seeing these tiny nanoparticles showing as signal. This is now validated through SEM, so that we see nanoparticles are indeed detected. You can use this kind of a technology for even looking at viral load. You can look at, for example, specifically captured viruses on a surface and through the phase signature count them. The specificity of your count will come from surface chemistry as well as size. Because it's not just a yes or no decision, we also quantify these particles. And all of this can be combined into the same framework to have a handheld and inexpensive design. This is the same uh, super resolution microscope that I've shown before, except now it's inverted. So now the LED array is here at the bottom, CMOS goes at the top. So it's now an inverted lensless microscope that gives you pixel super resolution. One additional feature here is this uh, additional unit here, which is having polyethylene glycol, which is heated up to about 100 Celsius degrees, which creates this vapor and it's condensing on the substrate to form these nano lenses around nanoparticles that are captured on the substrate. And the nanoparticles are facing down. And through this process, we can actually start to see these nanoparticles. Before condensation happens, before we start to heat up this pack, it's like trying to see the moon in a sunny day. You just see background noise. But after condensation, in a matter of a minute or two, you start to see these small particles showing up in the phase signature. The smallest that we have seen so far is about 40 nanometers. This is about visible wavelength, so it's lambda over 10, or even smaller than lambda over 10, in terms of the diameter of the particle that we can detect. And all of this is a very controlled process. As I start to deposit these nano lenses, I see the signature increasing. So the, it's getting above the noise level, up to a certain peak. After this, you're starting to weaken your refractive power. And after a while, it goes back to the noise level, because you've coated the entire thing with the PEG, so there is no refractive power. It's, the particle is hidden within the, the polyethylene glycol layer. So we can understand where, where there is diminishing return. Depending on your uh, temperature, you can easily form these nano lenses. And there's nothing that is destructive here because by the time the vapor hits the uh, substrate, we're cooled down to sub 40 Celsius. So there's nothing that is cooked here in terms of the sample. And all of this is quantified. It's not yes or no. Yes, there is a detection, but there is also the quantification. The phase signature that we get is actually correlating with the size of the particle. So through phase, optical phase that we detect, we can also understand the size of the particle with about a 10 nanometer sizing accuracy. And you can do this across a very large dynamic range of particle density, all the way from a single particle per 10 microliters of solution to several hundreds of thousands of particles uh, within your volume. This is a very powerful system in terms of the dynamic range of particles and in terms of the particle diameter range from sub 40 nanometers to several hundred, hundreds of microns or even millimeter scale particles can be uh, uh, detected and sized in a continuum. Compared to dynamic light scattering or other types of techniques that size particles, these two aspects are very unique. We're not assuming anything about the particle's refractive index, shape. This is a microscope, and that's why it would work for a triangular particle or a spherical particle, you name it. Those are big limitations for other types of optical uh, detection techniques. Of course, this kind of a system also helps us to um, bring some of these tools for other applications, such as looking at, for example, air quality 
and, and, and um, understanding uh, pollution through particulate matter. We've taken the next steps and created uh, platforms that integrate this kind of technology with, uh, with a system that intakes air and quantifies the particulate matter inside air. It's a huge problem. Uh, it's, it's surprising, but um, indoor air quality is even more problematic than outdoor air quality. Totally, we're losing about 7 million lives every year due to poor health, poor um, uh, air, um, uh, you know, poor air quality, and more than four million of those, unfortunately, are indoor air quality-related uh, problems. So uh, we created a very unique design, which um, takes about uh, six to seven liters of air within uh, about 30 seconds, deposits them on a, a substrate, and then this substrate is then imaged using our lensless technology to quantify. Um, uh, essentially the size distribution and also the, the density of these particles. And it's also integrated with an app so that this device reports its data, raw data, uh, through a mobile phone, and then the mobile phone is communicating with the servers for quantification of the results and then reporting back uh, a, a distribution like this, which is showing you um, uh, particle size as a function of uh, density in, in, in terms of number of particles per liter. Um, so we've done various different studies to validate this technology. This is actually um, an EPA. Uh, this is an Environmental Protection Agency uh, uh, approved device. Uh, it's a, it's a, a beta attenuation monitoring platform which we uh, took our device to correlate. So it, it shows very good correlation even though they measure different things. Essentially, uh, we have a very good correlation to uh, uh, what we call as the gold standard uh, measure. And uh, in our recent work, the, we've actually created some of these devices and took them uh, around Los Angeles Airport uh, to show that, in fact, um, the contamination that is created by flights at LAX uh, is impacting um, several kilometers away from LAX, especially for the flights that are landing. Uh, in the direction of the uh, landing flights, the spill coming uh, because of the fact that the flights are facing the wind, the exhaust is actually spilling uh, several kilometers away, and this is showing you how the daily average is decreasing, uh, but still uh, 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 above the uh, uh, background level uh, away from uh, LAX, maybe uh, even 10 kilometers away. This is very interesting because um, essentially every single airport that we have is designed similarly. The, the landing flights are facing the wind for, uh, for a, a good design. And that means that spill is actually not local. It's uh, distributed to several kilometers away from, from, uh, from the airport. So this is something that I think uh, is very interesting in terms of how you design airports and, and the life around the airport. Uh, this kind of a platform would be very useful, I believe, for uh, deployment as part of airports, as part of uh, homes, as, as part of essentially even cars, autonomous cars especially, so that you can actually have a dynamic network of uh, devices that quantify air very precisely uh, and very inexpensive so that you can actually deploy several hundreds of these easily. So, so far I've been focusing on lensless uh, technology and one thing that we were focused on is actually uh, resolution, contrast, performance, field of view, and, and, and volumetric imaging. But everything so far that I've talked involved stationary samples. So the samples were stationary and we were actually doing all sorts of uh, different types of imaging uh, through uh, a transmission object. But the same lensless uh, on-chip imaging framework could be also quite powerful when it comes to imaging locomotion in 3D. So in this next example that I'm gonna give you, I'll show you how the same simple uh, platform with some different set of uh, computational algorithms will help us look at a large volume of microsumers and track them in 3D with a very um, high accuracy of, of submicron in 3D and across a very large volume so that you can actually uh, place your microsumers on a chip and track them across a large volume like 10 microliters. In this example, we're gonna be focusing on sperm, human sperm, and um, I wanna track them in 3D, but not just a few of them, thousands of them, so that this giant volume here, which is about uh, 20 millimeters squared by half a millimeter, let's say about 10 microliters, is filled with uh, uh, sperm, and they're moving, and, and 
uh, we want to look at their locomotion in 3D without any restrictions and um, uh, create these kinds of uh, images where time is coded with color and every one of these colorful objects is showing you the time evolution of the sperm's head. This is going to be done differently than, than the previous design that I've shown. First of all, it's going to utilize also the same uh, on-chip imaging architecture, but we will have two light sources that are on at the same time from different perspectives. So we'll have a vertical illumination, but at the same time, we're gonna have an oblique illumination. So that uh, whatever the sperm is doing at that given time, it's gonna create two different shadows at two different angles. In addition to this, we're gonna also use the diversity of the wavelength so that this vertical one will have a red illumination color and this oblique one will have a blue. So this is gonna help me to differentiate different perspectives from each other so that I can look at the sperm from this vertical perspective and from oblique so that I can pinpoint to X, Y, and depth at the same time with a very good precision. You assume that I'm having here some sort of a color CMOS imager. In fact, this imager is a monocolor, so it's color blind. So we use color here in a different way to make use of it in our co computational routine. The sensor is color blind, but still those two angles and two different wavelengths, blue and, and, and red, help us to separate digitally those two perspectives from each other. If you look at the row, Hologram, this is a zoomed in version of what you see at the CMOS. These are the holograms created by sperms, their head. They're moving around, but the problem is there are too many of them and every sperm has two different uh, holograms, two different shadows, one blue, one red. But I don't know which one is which because my sensor is color blind. This only helps you if you were to reconstruct them. If you reconstruct the scene with the correct wavelength, and angle combination, you would see a perspective and you would see these tiny sperm, uh, sperm heads being reconstructed and tracked in two different perspectives. Everything else, like this one for example, is in fact a hologram that is recorded at the blue wavelength. So that's why it's diffusing away because it's the uh, perspective that I will get information from this one. Those two reconstructions digitally help us separate those two perspectives. And once you have this vertical perspective and oblique perspective, we can pinpoint X, Y, and Z depth information. So create large throughput, large volume, reconstructions of the 3D locomotion. It's a very high throughput system. Several hundred to several thousands of sperms can be tracked in parallel. This is a reconstruction of a human sperm that we've caught on video. This is actually a helical trajectory. The sperm head is within a second of its motion, doing 10 rotations per, per second. And this is the front view. It's a beautiful circle that is evolving as a function of time. This is happening four to five percent of the time in vitro. And this is the first time that this kind of locomotion has been directly observed. We knew that sperms conduct this kind of mo motion, but because of the limitations of traditional light microscopy, nobody could record a direct movie of it because it's very rare, as uh, the, the, our, our results showed, four to five percent, and this is moving in depth. So you'd be quickly losing it uh, out of focus. So this is where computation helps us because we're never out of focus. This is another one, it's a hyperactivated sperm. So this has got more energy, it's even more rare so it's slightly irregular, but still a beautiful helix. So you can now quantify various different types of 3D locomotion that normally we didn't know. We didn't quantify because we didn't have the tool set to do that at a high throughput and at the precision that you need. So you can look at sperms for hours. What we do is we place them uh, on our CMOS imager. We make sure that they're not cooked. So we monitor the temperature. And before they die, out of, uh, get out of uh, nutrition, it gives us about a two hour window that we can do a lot of imaging uh, while they're still swimming. So with this platform, we've quantified uh, 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 many thousands of sperm trajectories. It's, this is a summary of what we found out. So there are about 24,000 dots in here representing a modal sperm trajectory. 
their linearity, their curvilinear velocity, straight velocity, and other types of parameters that normally are used in in vitro fertilization in IVF clinics. These are now coming from 3D um, uh, trajectories. What is surprising here is that out of these 24,000, about 1,000 of them, 4 to 5%, is helical. So these are the 1,000 sperms that conduct a, a helix. But one thing that's very interesting and surprising to see is that there's a broken symmetry. Right-handed helices are the dominant ones. So only 10% of the helices are left-handed. So essentially, um, it's the throughput of this platform that enabled us to see 96 out of 24,000, which is the 10% of the uh, uh, helical uh, trajectories are left-handed. So this is showing you the power of this system in terms of revealing extremely rare events. This would be very difficult with traditional light microscopes to, to, to generate this kind of data. Um, and uh, since then, we've been playing with this platform and we pushed its, its performance uh, greatly. Uh, you can actually um, uh, do various different um, interesting experiments with different species. Using, for example, horse, we have discovered some new types of locomotion that was never observed before because of, again, um, uh, limitations of traditional uh, optical imaging. Uh, this is in the form of a ribbon. So this time, the sperm head is conducting a sinusoidal pattern, but the pattern itself is twisting. Like, for example, this helical ribbon does, or this twisted ribbon does. So these are beautiful mathematical functions that we've uh, found um, horse sperm conduct in 3D. Later, we looked into horse uh, human data, and extremely rarely, human uh, sperms also sometimes do this kind of helical uh, 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 ribbons. This is actually one of the movies coming from horse. So as you can see, it's, uh, this is the front view and this is how uh, the zigzag pattern is twisting. I'll fast forward in the interest of time. So this is giving you the, uh, uh, the, the perspective that now that's going to give you uh, the, the ribbons that are uh, created. So this is another one. This is a twisted ribbon. Also fast forwarded it. This one is actually a, a beautiful mathematical function in itself. This is a helicoid. Um, it's got also zero net curvature to it. It's a minimal function, just like a catenoid is. So we started with catenoids to uh, see individual viruses, these beautiful uh, uh, nano lenses that form around um, viruses. That's actually also the same family of functions that the sperm um, head conducts. So, uh, uh, Entirely different physics, but interesting in, in the sense that uh, there's some interesting um, uh, common mathematical um, domain for those two uh, different physical processes. So um, this is showing you how computation can really push the boundaries of, of optical imaging to look at difficult 3D um, um, uh, patterns. And in, in fact, recently we've extended this to uh, some, some new uh, um, uh, domain in which now we can look at sperm tail and head at the same time at high frame rates. This is actually a beautiful uh, bovine sperm that is having its head rotate. So what you see here is the red, blue, the red, green, and orange is representing the local coordinate system. It's the sperm's head if, as if somebody's sitting there. That sperm head is actually rotating around its own axis. That's that's very unique. There are no other microscopes that have shown that kind of a behavior directly in 3D. And this is how the tail, as a function of that, is evolving in 3D. So these are some very unique capabilities that are enabled through computation, making use of CMOS images and new forms of reconstruction algorithms to kind of bring a very powerful platform for looking at high throughput events. Uh, that are very detailed and rich in 3D. So, and all of this is coming together thanks to essentially um, mobile phones. The economies of scale that is created through mobile phones enabled us to, uh, uh, to uh, push the boundaries of imaging, making it compact, cost-effective, integrated with mobile phones, but at the same time, pushing the uh, frontiers of imaging in terms of what you can do with a, at least certain applications, certain, um, um, uh, certain um, uh, imaging needs. So I'll stop here in the interest of time and summarize that actually um, computational imaging enabled through um, spatially mobile phones and, and components of mobile phones, it has created a, a unique opportunity for us 
to bring advanced biomedical measurements that we normally enjoy in, in lab settings to the field, to resource poor settings. It has huge implications for telemedicine, bringing, for example, those kinds of tools to the home to monitor, for example, uh, chronic patients would cost, uh, with lots of cost savings, are some of the opportunities that we have. The same is true for global health-related applications. Uh, bringing the functions of an advanced lab to essentially uh, remote locations. These are, I think, very exciting uh, applications uh, that would stem from this kind of work. But there's one more which I'll briefly emphasize, and that is education. Some of the cost effectiveness that um, is brought and the simplicity that's brought by these kinds of uh, uh, interfaces will, I believe, also democratize education. And, and some of those experiments that would normally require an advanced infrastructure could now be done at a fraction of the cost. Even maybe high school students would be able to do some of the, those measurements uh, with a simple um, mobile phone and an attachment that is very cost effective. In fact, that's something that I'm very passionate about and I'm, I'm working with some middle schools to bring some of these mobile phone microscopes to their curriculum so that, for example, a middle school kid or a high school kid would be able to see a single DNA after 30 minutes of simple uh, experiment with his or her own mobile phone. That is possible. That's certainly possible within the uh, limits of the technology. I think we need uh, more uh, innovative ways of diffusing some of this information to their curriculum. With this, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for having me here. And I look forward to uh, interacting with you through, throughout the breaks uh, and the coffee breaks and other uh, poster sessions to exchange more information um, about how some of these tools will be useful for your research and vice versa. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've got time for at least a couple of short questions. So uh, thanks a lot for a fascinating talk. Uh, about the end, uh, the stuff at the end with the, the sperm with these beautiful different patterns, do you, have a, do, do you have some biological insight on why they do these patterns and why different species, after all, evolutionary, not that different ones, uh, do different patterns? And it's a great question. <laughs> We are not yet uh, at that stage of looking into um, uh, the biological significance of these. I think it's the next step for us. Uh, this platform is very unique in that it can run some of these experiments and, 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 and try to answer some of these questions in a high throughput manner. So, I mean, one of the next steps that we're, we are um, uh, planning for is to actually create compartments uh, within our field of view where they will have different chemicals and maybe different uh, um, uh, attractants for the sperm and uh, understand the impact of, um, of pH, temperature, and some of the uh, chemical stimuli uh, and how it's going to essentially drive them. So when I shown that last uh, movie where the sperm head was spinning, maybe it is the mode that the sperm thinks uh, it is close to the, the, the egg, and maybe that's going to give the additional advantage to penetrate through the um, 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 uh, membrane of the, um, uh, the, the cell. But those are questions that we need to understand, um, because when we look at these kinds of measurements, um, we're looking at bulk statistics. We need to now look into uh, um, how those statistics are affected as you perturb um, the, uh, the nutritions or uh, the chemicals or the gradients that you can induce in each observation volume. And one thing that we're very excited about here is the landscape of our measurements. Uh, because we have 10 microliters to, to our uh, imaging uh, uh, volume, we can even have maybe uh, 10 by 10 experiments done in parallel. This is something that I, I am very uh, interested in pushing forward to answer more interesting questions beyond just uh, the tool. But it all starts with the tool. <laughs> so uh, we don't have, so this is one, one, one thing that I think, uh, we didn't have funding and a hypothesis that was driving us for this tool set. It was purely curiosity. It was a, a technical challenge that I knew it, it was possible and I knew that we could drive the system to give me everything about a sperm. Tail, head, and all, all the, uh, the 3D morphology between the tail and the head. We're now at a position to, you know, we've matured the tool. Now we, we want to see what is it answering 
what are the hypotheses that can be answered by this. So we weren't hypothesis driven up to this point for the sperm imaging, but now it's about the time. Yeah, uh, here. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. I have a very practical question about what is the uh, optical power you, you, you shine on uh, the samples and what, what is the potential impact on the biological material? This is a very low power LED, so um, um, our, integ uh, so our integration time here as, in a single snapshot is uh, uh, a, a millisecond at most. So uh, in that regard, uh, these are extremely low power systems. Because the sample is very close to the sensor, uh, all the light is captured. So the capture efficiency of photons here is uh, occurring over a very large NA. So um, this system is very unique in the sense that even though there is pixelation, the detection numerical aperture is the refractive index of liquid that you use there. But these are very photon efficient uh, processes. So, uh, uh, typically, uh, microwatts of power is sufficient, and our integration times are sub-millisecond, which means um, sometimes we do pulse uh, systems so that we even uh, uh, make it uh, uh, much, much smaller amounts of um, uh, time duration so that we can capture actually moving objects uh, in a flow, for example, without smearing. Okay. Let's thank the speaker once again.